Hello, welcome back. Um, so um, we're going to welcome our next speaker, uh, Mr. Chris Schilling. Chris is the Director of Regulatory Affairs and the Director of the Drug and Device Development Services at Nationwide Children's Hospital. Uh, Chris launched the first program to support faculty on regulated therapeutic development back in 2012 under the Drug and Device Development Services at Nationwide. Uh, this program works very closely with faculty and staff to, under, to understand US FDA regulations for drugs and devices. He works with research teams developing novel therapeutics and advises on critical steps and milestones toward or early phase clinical trials and how to navigate uh, the complex regulations in support of market applications and enhanced treatments. So please welcome Mr. Schilling. All right, good morning everybody. Thank you for joining and thank you for inviting me to come speak to this group. Um, I'm going to be talking today about biologics. Um, before we jump in, I would like to see maybe a quick survey. How many of you are engaged in clinical trials right now, human subject trials? Great, good, good show of hands. How many of you are doing discovery work, you know, in a lab setting, looking at opportunities with drugs or devices or new biologics? Good show, great. Um, how many are working with, as far as they understand, a biologic product? Any show of hands? Okay, a few, a few. So um, I'm a director of the regulatory or drug and device development service, which is a regulatory program at Children's Hospital. Um, I'm going to be sharing with you some of our experiences there. Um, I guess maybe another survey is how many of you are aware of the Zolgensma SMA uh, drug therapy that recently got approved? A few. Good. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about that uh, story, um, putting it in context. Uh, our learnings from that experience, as well as many others at uh, Children's Hospital, in, in, uh, mostly focused around gene therapies, but there's a broad category of biologics. And um, for those who aren't familiar with the Zolgensma story, I'll give you a quick uh, tidbit just so you understand where this is coming from. <clears throat> in 2011, as you'll see in the, in the slides, uh, Nationwide Children's Hospital embarked in collaboration with Ohio State University on a uh, drug development therapy program for spinal muscular atrophy, atrophy type 1. And um, we had great successes in getting that trial launched at Children's Hospital. And in uh, just this past May, uh, Zolgensma, as the, as the trade name, <clears throat> was approved by the FDA as a new therapy for SMA type 1. And that uh, drug therapy has shown great, impressive uh, responses in children with SMA type 1 that would normally um, have uh, life expectancy no beyond, uh, not beyond two years of age. And we've now been able to curtail that, that, that patient population, and it's been a transformative medicine. <clears throat> so um, quick disclosures. I have no financial interest in what I'm about to present to you, but just full uh, acknowledgement that NCH and my program have received funding and a variety of contracts and grants from industry partners that are part of some of the conversations I'm presenting today. So the Drug and Device Development Service is established here to help understand where discoveries are made and the opportunities that may lay, uh, lie out there for marketable and, and technology transfers. Um, but recognizing that the ability to market these technologies, there lies a, this uh, translational valley of death where programs fail to thrive, fail to move forward, get stuck in a continuum of uh, recycled research and uh, are never able to make it into a clinical setting. It is our service there to help support the bridging of these opportunities, taking discoveries into clinics and putting out opportunities to make them more uh, technology commercializable or marketable. We see ourselves as a, a balance between some of the research that's ongoing and our commercial partnerships. Um, we don't uh, take over the responsibilities of our OTC or technology commercialization office we become a steward, a partnership with your industry partners um, to help move data and information along in a, in a compliant manner so that our industry partners, as they find these opportunities, license technologies from us, they can be successful in that transfer and, and moving these um, campaigns forward. So a couple points I'm going to talk about today is summarize, summarize the uh, recent regulatory considerations governing biologic drug development. Um, we're going to review some of the challenges and opportunities in biologic drug development as compared to small molecules, where maybe more of you may have some experience in small molecule development, and a, a brief discussion on the current challenges in clinical applications and commercial opportunities for biologics. 
So I'm going to use some terminology in this uh, talk. I'm going to make sure everyone's on the same page. So just cover briefly what is an IND. And an IND in this setting is an investigative new drug. It was originally uh, um, put out by the Food and Drug Administration as a permission to ship experimental drugs across state lines prior to its market approval. In today's setting, it is essentially the mechanism that FDA allows or authorizes administration of investigational unapproved drugs in humans. And it's the mechanism that the FDA is able to gather data for, to evaluate for safety and unreasonable risk. We're talking about the Food and Drug Administration. It's a very large organization in our government. It sits under the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, as you can see, we have a variety of services beyond just drug development. You got food and safety, tobacco products, veterinary medicine. But I want to touch on these three uh, branches under the FDA, the um, Center for Drug Evaluation Research, that's your common small molecule branch that oversees and regulates small molecule discoveries. Centers for Devices and Radi Radiological Health, those are your med devices. But we're really talking about today is the Center for Biological, uh, Biologics Evaluation and Research, that's CBER. And so abundance of the work that we've been doing is falling under this branch, uh, now directed by Peter Marks. Um, Scott Gottlieb, our prior uh, commissioner, has stepped down. We now have an uh, acting uh, commissioner of the FDA. But I'll be talking about some of the things that Scott Gottlieb did while he was in office. All right. What's a biologic? Well, a biologic um, essentially is composed of, you know, sugars, proteins, um, DNA uh, sequences. It's derived from natural sources or, or living sources. I'm going to define a couple of examples of what biologics are based on the uh, branch of the FDA that evaluates it. So in CBER, your <clears throat> uh, Office for Biologic Evaluation and Research, they oversee a majority of the biologics I'll be talking about. You got um, uh, extracts for allergy shots, blood and uh, blood components, gene therapy products, which is a big part of my conversation today, uh, devices and test kits, human tissue and cellular products used in transplantation as well as vaccines. CDER, your drug side, actually evaluates biologics as well. And this is most, like, most commonly due to the fact that these biologics do mimic some of the pharmacokinetic uh, characteristics that small molecules may have, where they have absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion qualities that uh, CDER will evaluate, monoclonal antibodies, cytokines, growth factors, enzymes, and immune modulators. But this is a small subset out of the entire uh, population of biologics that are, again, are, are mostly regulated by CBER and a couple examples of those products. So why are we talking about biologics today? Well, um, I don't know, in the news, there's been quite an increase in activity in biologics. I'll be talking about some case examples, but, you know, in recent history, there was an uptick in biological development, mostly around monoclonal antibodies, but it's really starting somewhere in, in this state, you can barely see my pointer, but, um, the human genome was uh, understood, sequenced, and that now has provided the opportunity for scientists to really under understand uh, single gene mutations, um, inheritable diseases, and we've had a massive uptick, and particularly in this gene therapy application or applications, a major, a major uptick in the development of new biologic applications based on the understanding of the human genome. In most recent news, we have a couple of milestones that have been hit. In 2017, we saw the first two genetically engineered cell therapies uh, approved by the FDA uh, under CAR T cell treatments. Those are the Chemriya and Yescarta. So these are your chimeric antigen receptor T cells that are tumor killing T, T cells engineered in the lab. In 2018, we saw the first gene replacement therapy um, approved by the FDA, Luxturna, for retinal diseases. And now we get to see the transition of money in this field is substantial. And um, as I mentioned, the spinal muscular atrophy program that was initiated at Children's Hospital with a collaboration with Ohio State, Novartis acquired the startup company Avexis at $8.7 billion um, in 2018. We see a lot of other big moves. So the, the industry is moving heavy into this space. There's a lot of activity, and it's, it's exciting um, to see this growth. It's also uh, interesting to understand what is the future going to hold for us. Is 
abundance of my talk is to establish that this is a new means of medicine that's coming forth, and the FDA is beginning to prepare for it. Discoveries are still being made, and the opportunities for researchers like yourself to um, develop these opportunities is, is great. So again, I just want to highlight the great opportunity we saw, a program initiated within our own, or with our, within our own organizations, the opportunity for it to get a full approval. Uh, BLA is the biologic uh, license application that granted um, the SMA uh, gene therapy, now termed Zolgensma, approval uh, just this past couple months. And so this is just one of more we expect to come in this field. And Scott Gottlieb, our prior commissioner of the FDA, um, made, a, made a statement recently, and these were some of the numbers he's predicting and how the FDA is trying to prepare for it. In the year 2025, the FDA expects to be approving, approving 10 to 20 cellular gene therapies a year. That's, that's huge. We only have a handful on the market currently. New clinical reviewers are being um, constantly uh, recruited into the FDA. Um, they're looking at around 50 new hires. And by the year 2020, the expectation is there's about 20 cellular gene therapy investigational new applications ongoing in review per year at the FDA. So really big numbers. The FDA is gearing up to prepare for this um, onboarding of, of applications. And what's interesting to hear, I thought this slide was, was um, interesting, to see where the indications are, are landing in some of these uh, biologic applications. As you can see, almost two-thirds uh, reside in either rare diseases or onco oncology diseases. At Nationwide Children's Hospital, we live right here in this rare disease population. Almost all of our applications for uh, gene therapy uh, programs are sitting in a rare disease group. All right, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about what are the regulations on biologics. So if you're a cell or tissue, um, you land in one of two categories right off the bat. Um, the FDA uh, has uh, two mechanisms for regulating uh, uh, tissue or cell products. Under Section 361 of the Public Health Service Act, if you're a minimally manipulated human cell tissue or cellular tissue product, um, you are unregulated at high, at, at, at most, in most, most mechanisms. You don't have a market application. You're only registered as a, as a manufacturer of these types of products. So it's a highly uh, unregulated space, um, and I'll go into more detail. Versus what we really are talking about today is under Section 351 of the PHS Act, you, if you're not minimally manipulated, then you most likely are treated as a drug product cell or tissue. And so we'll, we'll define this a little bit more, just so you understand the, the, the differences. Um, minimally manipulated human cells and tissues. Um, minimally manipulated really is about um, not altering the fate of that cell, that you have taken out of the body, maybe reconstituted in a solution that should not be consisting of anything other than water, crystalloids, sterilizing, or preserving agents. Essentially, it's just the cell taken from its native environment, reconstituted, and you're giving it back in a homologous use, homologous being that you aren't putting it in a new environment. I'm not taking stem cells from the patient and putting them back into, say, the brain or some other region that it's not native to. And so in this case, if you're hitting these marks, plus some conditions on are you, is the cell or tissue uh, therapy being utilized as, uh, for a systemic effect or relying on metabolic factors, um, then it's uh, highly unregulated under 1271 as a minimally manipulated human cell. So this kind of falls into your bone marrow transplant programs or other formats of, of uh, just a transplant and not a drug product. Examples here, bone, skin, blood vessels, articulate cartilage, adipose tissue, and tendons as, as some examples. Um, I have here a display of your cadaver tendon, which is commonly utilized in... Um, you know, uh, knee or joint replacement surgeries. Um, these are regulated under that uh, clause of minimally manipulated tissue and cells, and you uh, really have a, a lack of responsibility on those programs. And so here, we're going to really now get into what are the biologic products. Those are the 351 regulated programs. These are treated as drugs. As comparison to the 361, these are the minimally manipulated products. 
HTTP. Um, so for a drug product, it does require um, a review by FDA for marketing applications. You do have labeling claims because you're putting therapeutic use. Um, there's a, a variety of studies and testing to be done on these products for potency or purity, as well as the requirement for doing clinical studies to support the applications. You get market exclusivity and a variety of other things. So these are your common drug products. These are just more, again, just drilling home that the differences between these types of regulatory, regulated uh, biologics. So I'm going to now talk about some of the advantages the FDA and other um, regulatory uh, programs have provided to biologics. And so this is started in 2016 under the 21st Century Cures Act, uh, government announced the um, Regenerative Medicine Advanced Therapy designation, RMAT. And this was in place to expedite the development and review of regenerative medicine and advanced therapy. So what is a regenerative medicine therapy? Um, and it, um, these are cell therapies, therapeutic tissue, engineered products, human cell tissue products, and combination products. What you notice in this definition is there's no gene therapies or uh, genetically engineered cell therapies. Um, that came to be as a, what appeared to be like a mistake. Uh, Scott Gottlieb got up in front recently and it basically announced that they are realigning this designation to support uh, genetically modified cell therapies and gene therapies as long as they present a durable effect, okay? So this now includes gene therapies. It's a designation that the FDA can grant applicants. And what does this do? Um, well, here again, you have to be uh, eligible for it. You have to be a regenerative medicine, as I described on that prior slide. Um, you have to show that you intend to treat, modify, reverse, or cure a serious or life-threatening disease or condition. So um, criticality of the severity of the disease is important. And you also must show an already preclinical or clinical evidence. So you already have to have done a trial to achieve some of this designation, but that the, that the drug has the potential to meet an unmet medical need. So if you get this designation, what it provides is the ability for a priority review. These are highly valued in the market space. These are, these are now being sold off at high dollar amounts for between companies. To, get, to receive a priority voucher is, 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 is a major win. You're also putting into an accelerated approval process that uh, the FDA grants for you know, establishing surrogate or uh, intermediate clinical endpoints to allow your study to succeed or predict long-term clinical benefits under uh, surrogate markers. And it basically you become an open door with the agency. You have a lot more dialogue with them. It provides some benefits if you're a drug developer or manufacturer. This is exclusive to, again, as a, as a biologic. These, don't, these kinds of designation, this designation does not exist for small molecule. And so you can see, see where the designations are being distributed currently. You've got uh, a majority in cell therapy products for allogeneic cells, but as well as other areas of cell therapy, as well as gene therapies, tissue engineering, et cetera. So it's a growing um, uh, uh, program, and um, we already have pursued this on a couple of programs we've been developing at Children's Hospital. I want to talk about um, now some of the benefits about providing opportunity to access the FDA early on in your development plan. Um, at Children's Hospital, we really advocate early interaction with the agency is critical, um, getting alignment with them, understanding their thoughts on how the programs are developing. Um, you can't get better advice than from the uh, persons who are going to be reviewing your program directly. So we really advocate and really put in mechanisms to engage with them as much as, and, uh, and as often as we can. So what uh, CBER does is actually offer it access to even earlier meetings than what CEDAR would normally offer you. In CBER, they have what has been historically known as the pre-IND pre meeting, which is a meeting before the meeting to talk about your IND application. Um, they decided to change the uh, nomenclature instead of calling it a pre-pre. They now have engineered the term INTERACT, which is a lovely acronym to define the initial targeted engagement of, for regulatory advice on CBER products. And I really applaud the FDA for coming up with that acronym. It's quite impressive. So um, this is exclusive only to programs under CBER. It replaces uh, the pre-pre-IND uh, meeting program. And it allow the, allows the developers, sponsors, to obtain initial non-binding advice on a variety of issues pertaining to chemistry, uh, manufacturing issues, toxicology, clinical aspects. And we have held these meetings um, multiple times uh, over the course of our program. And I'll touch, touch on this as, uh, in regards to the Zolgensma case. 
Um, so the FDA is putting this together to help sponsors conduct their early product characterization, preclinical studies. So these are all just animal work. What have we defined in the animal? What, what are our indicators that we have a good uh, outcome measure that can maybe translate into a clinical setting? Um, Initiate discussions on if you have a delivery device, do you have to use some sort of special pump or syringe? These are actually issues that the FDA is going to dial in that you will need to resolve before you get into trials. Um, you know, inform sponsors about overall early phase trial design, not getting in heavy detail, but just concepts um, and any critical issues uh, for the sponsor to address. So we really, uh, for my program and the uh, people on my team, we really encourage that once there's a proof of concept that's identified, that you have evidence that I can maybe generate a therapeutic event with my model, with my product, that we really begin a gap analysis and reviewing what do we, what do we know about this, what don't we know, what, what kind of studies have we done, what studies we need to do, and depending on that out outcome, we may want to engage the agency on this early interact meeting, or what used to be known as pre-pre-ID. And um, I'm now going to tell this story about the SMA program and how it relates to these kind of interactions. Um, some of you may have heard this piece before. but for, So again, spinal muscular atrophy is a leading genetic cause for infant mortality in one out of 10,000 lives births. Um, in a normal patient, you have two copies of the SMN gene, the survival motor neuron gene. SMN1 is a functional gene that generates good functional SMN protein, which is critical for your motor neuron health and motor neuron function. You also have a second copy of this survival motor neuron uh, gene called SMN2 that has a small uh, substitution of a cytosine to tyrosine at the exon splice site uh, and create, that creates um, abundance of abnormal non-functional SMN protein, but a small percentage of functional protein. That's in a normal individual. In SMA, there is a defect in the SMN gene, and so you have a complete loss of, or a high loss of functional SMN protein, but you still have the uh, SMN2 gene that creates a small amount of functional protein. And this is important to understand that, the, that you have this homologous uh, gene with small uh, production of functional protein because that can come in multiple copies in individuals. And so the number of SMN2 copies dictates how severe the disease is in these patients. In SMA type 1, which was this trial that we initiated with uh, children's in Ohio, at Ohio State, um, we selected those individuals that had the most severe cases where they only had a limited number of SMN2, therefore a very low amounts of expression of SMN uh, functional protein. The natural history of SMA type 1 is devastating. These kids are born uh, floppy, uh, unable to uh, 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 pick up their heads, roll over, sit alone. And it's a survival curve here displayed that shows that um, you know, at, at 20 months of age, there's only an 8% survival. Uh, at 13 and a half months, you've got a 25% survival. And uh, only 50% 50 50 survival at 10 and a half months. So it's a devastating disease for these infants. Um, at our proof of concept, and this was a, in the uh, collaboration with Ohio State and Nationwide Children's, um, we had the Delta 7 mouse generated by Dr. Arthur Burgess here at Ohio State. Um, we were able to identify, uh, Dr. Brian Kaspar's lab at Nationwide Children's was able to identify some of the uh, proof of concept work and obtaining an um, optimal biological dose uh, showing survival of these Delta 7 lethal mice at more than 400 days post-treatment. And that uh, this was also uh, a dose response showing a low dose res only reduces survival to 35 days. And so we had good, clear dose response information as well as a, a time dependence that earlier intervention was most beneficial. So armed with this information, early evidence and a publication around this work, we then engaged the agency at that early inter meeting, at a pre-IND -pre meeting as it was defined then, now defined as the interact. And this was critical because we were able to establish that meeting after a written request, and we had to provide basically that body of work. It was about 14 pages of information. And through that, we uh, built our team of uh, experts. We had Brian Casper, as I mentioned, in, in the labs at Children's, Arthur Burgess here at Ohio State in the mouse model. We, Combined with our manufacturing teams, we have a GMP manufacturing facility at Children's Hospital. At that time, it was led by Reed Clark, who is now part of uh, Srepta Therapeutics. 
And we um, engaged some of the uh, pharmacology te uh, toxicology expertise at Charles River and combined with the clinical experts, Dr. Jerry Mandela Children's and John Kissel here at Ohio State, uh, engaged the agency at this meeting. It was held in 2011, and um, we had questions around preclinical data and toxicology studies, but most importantly, we were engaging them about what was the agency's uh, appetite for allowing us to start a first in human trial in infants versus a common application for drug development is to seek out either um, unaffected adults. But um, based on the severity and risks associated with this disease, our intent was to seek this out in the most critical patients and uh, apply this at, in the SMA type 1. The FDA was clear about their concerns and restrictions about this study design, and we walked them through where we could come to a justification to support that application based on a lot of logistics and safety concerns and inability to justify using this product in an, an adult uh, SMA patients that have already lost all function and really lack, lack may, may not uh, generate an outcome measure that we could report. So after these early meetings, there's also the, the more common pre-IND meeting that uh, is supported by CEDAR. You'll see this in small molecule uh, space. And um, these interactions, again, I can't stress enough how important they are to have these interactions with the agency. We proceeded with our pre-IND meeting um, with the FDA is these are more formal meetings held around pivotal talk studies like now saying okay What do I need to do to actually enable that clinical trial? We've we've conceptualized what may the study design may be But we're now really locking in and getting fully aligned with the FDA and what are our critical uh, Checkpoints to be successful in our application of an IND and so it's it's looking at the uh, planning for a successful ID. It's a you have to provide a pretty comprehensive briefing document three days prior to the meeting. So it does take an, an ex exceeding amount of work. We, it took us about a year to put this work together. Um, so we had a, our original meeting was in early 2011 January. This was held in December of that same year, and um, we, it was it's held within 60 days of a written request. Um, we presented our plans for studies. And the FDA will give you uh, written uh, meeting minutes following this meeting. And that's critical to have those uh, documents from the agency. At the time, in 2011, we had a variety of individuals participate in the phone call. This was a teleconference. You can do these face-to-face, -face, but um, it's more feasible just to do it over the phone. Um, it's only 60 minutes, but you now get, as you can see, we had branch chiefs in the agency participating on this call, which was not, it's not too common you got that, you have this kind of representation. It was obvious at the time the agency recognized there was some, impact, some, some substantial impact on the program we're developing. After the meeting, you have now set yourself pretty clear on expectations and the track you need to fulfill to get into a clinical trial. That's based on written minutes from the agency giving you clear feedback of, hey, this is what we think works. It doesn't work. You need to go and do this something else differently. And essentially, it's a true roadmap. And um, you now have a clear picture of what, you know, there's toxicology studies normally need to be done in this sense. Um, maybe under GLP settings, you have clear guidance to the agency what's going to be acceptable, what's not, as well as if you need to meet uh, manufacturing needs as well. Well, I think one important aspect for you to understand is that having that interaction now, getting written minutes from the agency, giving them you feedback on your program is highly valuable as a technology developer, a, a entrepreneur, if you want to call it in that sense, that you are doing discovery work that does lend to the opportunity for commercialization. And it's this opportunity now have generated a significant inflection point for your, and I'll put the quotes on investor, because that investor could be your federal granting agency, it could be the NIH, or it could be industry sponsors, depending on what they view and how they look at this. But you now have really de-risked the technology at a certain level that you can move quicker and faster through your, through your development plans, um, you, know, you know, depending on with, um, with your sponsors. Okay. Shifting gears a little bit. Now I'm going to talk about some of the changes our government and agencies have been applying in the regulation of biologics. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with recombinant DNA advisory committee. Anyone heard of this? So it's an uh, agency in the NIH that was um, uh, chartered um, early, in the early 2000s to be an ethical and um, scientific review board on uh, recombinant DNA, recombinant DNA uh, applications in therapies as well as human subject trials. 
And last year, uh, our NIH director, uh, Francis Collins, and the FDA commissioner, Scott Gottlieb, um, decided to reevaluate that, that program and basically came away with that um, since the inception of the recombinant DNA advisory committee, RAC, um, there's become a lot of redundancies over time in the uh, review of these applications for human subjects research and decided that the, they needed to streamline the approach. And so, um, to give you more context, the a committee is a committee of scientists and researchers that are convened in a public forum that decide if you're doing research uh, on human subjects using recombinant DNA, they can decide if your protocol or program work, constitutes a need for public review. And it goes in front of the committee, they'll, they'll ask you questions, and you literally will have to stand up in front of them in a public setting and um, answer their questions on scientific integrity, uh, safety, uh, ethical issues as well. But in 2018, 2018 it became pr uh, clear from the agencies that this is no longer necessary. The FDA does this to a high degree. And so they essentially uh, dis dismembered a little bit of the, of the committee. Um, they did away with the re re responsibilities of protocol submission of these applications under Appendix M of the NIH guidelines. And essentially, instead of having this uh, committee established for public review, it's reconstituted as a, um, a, a, another fancy acronym, the Novel and Exceptional Technology and Research Advisory Committee, now known as NEXTRAC. Um, this is all very new. This is a, as of just the spring of this year. And they'll be convening the first time in the September, but this committee will be advising the NIH director uh, for transparent discussions about the scientific safety and ethical and social issues are associated with emerging biotechnologies. So um, that's just one point about some of the things that are changing in the regulation of these programs. Um, but it, this is our general flow of how we try to approach some of our programs and going through proof of concept, gap assessments, and early engagement with the FDA, and then applying the feedback we receive from the FDA in actual work through manufacturing of a product that's suitable for clinical trials, um, conducting studies that are going to allow us to start our human subject trial, and parallel doing other background regulatory work for the IBC application, maybe IRB, but as I, as I mentioned now, RAC is no longer required, so that streamlines it a little bit and we are no longer held to those responsibilities. I will say that I'm gonna touch on some more elements that where the FDA is continuously um, increasing the, the evaluation and scrutiny on biologics as this is a growing field. And um, I'll give you some uh, points on that as I review the challenges and opportunities for biologic development as compared to the small molecule field. And so I, I think this uh, slide's interesting. It does a, kind of a comparison of the small molecule uh, complexity and size versus your biologic uh, pr products. And just by sheer size, the convention of a bicycle and its simplicity, simplicity as compared to small molecules, when you're looking at monoclonal antibodies based on sheer size and complexity, it's like flying a uh, business jet. And so this really shows up in, in the um, development aspects of these kinds of products. And um, here's another kind of slide, just kind of comparison, putting side by side comparisons of what, what, it, what the challenges may be in um, biologics as versus small molecules. Obviously the structures uh, are more complex. Um, there are more invasive measures for administration biologics. You can't just take them by mouth or mostly are being administered through some sort of uh, parental or in, uh, invasive injections. Um, there is also distribution concerns as well as the biggest element that really challenges biologics is the fact that they can generate uh, immunogenicity concerns and you have to evaluate that strongly in most protocols. So there's, there's, some, there's some difficulties that biologics bring in their um, development process. And this slide is pretty busy, but it just kind of helps to capture, at least on the gene therapy side, the complexity of making these products in some regard. Um, there's a variety of different steps in making these biologic products, from cell expansions that are master cell banks, your little working factories that help create virus for you, uh, transfection of these uh, cell banks with plasmids that I'll touch upon some of the challenges this offers, V making virus uh, production, we usually typically use these plastic uh, hyperstacks that have an adherent cell properties. So we use an adherent cell line that connects to all the plastic surface in these areas. 
through recovery of the product, purification, and, and your final drug product is then isolated here. And this, is, this takes multiple weeks, if not months, and then further on testing. It's a substantial process and, and costly. So coming back to why we uh, bring this up is, is just understanding that the challenges in doing this kind of work and what Biologics has offered is that the agency is still growing understanding how to do this in the best capacity. And I've talked about um, this plasmid transfection process. In making virus, you utilize three plasmids. It's called a triple tra uh, plasmid transfection. And in this, you have a helper plasmid. This is just co uh, coiled DNA that's being transfected into a host cell. You have an ad helper gene on this uh, plasmid. You have two rep cap genes on this second plasmid. And your third plasmid is at your uh, gene of interest, your transgene plasmid. That's really your, gonna be your therapeutic element. But these are considered like raw materials in a manufacturing process. You infect a cell, uh, we use this uh, adherent HEK293 cell line, and you generate eventually through purification a, a uh, AAV particle that has your gene of interest package inside it. That is essentially your drug product, okay? So I bring this up is because the, uh, the, you have a manu we supply our plasmids through manufacturers that um, generate these plasmids. They put them through our production process and we then generate our, our, our viral particle and we screen it to ensure integrity by genetic sequencing to show that it has our gene of interest. But we found some, at one case, a presence of an unmatched DNA sequence. What was that? Um, our investigations led to us to find that, um, and this is in the public sector so I can speak about it, but um, our plasma manufacturer, our raw material manufacturer, uh, failed to um, produce uh, clean material. We had an unknown uh, DNA sequence within our material that was introduced in our manufacturing process and was being uh, packaged in a viral product. This is unrelated to any of our three triple plasmids. This then generates potential risks. Now you have the potential of packaging an unknown gene in, in your viral particle. What is that gene's risks and con uh, concerns? What does it produce? What does it express? Were all things we had to evaluate. And this became in our partnership in Disrupta that they were very open and disclosed this, that this, this, this uh, anomaly generated a, a clinical hold. And um, the hold was related to the FDA's concerns around control and cleaning and segregation and material, uh, control over raw material coming in through a facility. And this didn't just affect our program, it's, it's, a, it's a global perspective that now has been a, a put upon a lot of programs in this space. Um, at the time, we're working under phase one clinical trials where the guidance from FDA does allow the acceptance of raw materials in a manufacturing process to be sourced from research or non-GMP facilities. But this finding and the uh, discussions we had with the agency now has turned the tone, and this is just to reflect that there's a growing field in the every day, week, or month, we're seeing a change in the regulation and how they approach this. It um, there's just very little understanding still to date. We're still in a growing field. And so the FDA basically defined that there is cleaning and segregation concerns from our raw material supplier, and we had to be now be sourcing this from more uh, uh, sufficient manufacturing facilities. Uh, basically meeting certain, certain GMP standards. And, and that's significant from a, from a developer and academic program that we're being held to some higher qualities. So what is this all about? So just understanding that in the biologic space, once something that's, big, that's a different piece than the, the small molecule is that your starting materials are very heterogeneous mix, uh, mixtures. You've got cells and media, that's your raw material. If you're in a small molecule space, you're dealing with an analyte dissolved in a solution, and that's it. Um, these uh, raw materials also may be made through genetically engineered cells that even a cell can behave in a variable fashion. It, you're relying on the process of life that you can't always control. And so there is a variety of issues in how we make material in the biologic space. And these are also very expensive. So you're, 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 in, you're encroaching on highly expensive processes. So the FDA has recognized this, and now they've also come out and announced that 80% of their time on the review of applications, whether it be for market approval or for clinical trial use, 
We just spent on, manu on the issues of manufacturing quality issues. So this is, and we're feeling this. Um, we are constantly being scrutinized less on the clinical applications, but just on how are you making the material you use. And so for those of you engaging in the ex aspects of doing development work with Biologic, I really hone in on the fact that you need to begin starting quality measures early on. What are your characteristics? How are you measuring it? What is the um, uh, acceptance criteria for a product you're going to do an experiment, whether it be a mouse or at the bench? That these are attributes the agency is eventually going to come back later on and challenge you about how you have come to those qualities. So this is a big burden on manufacturing, and there's only so many facilities out there that can do this kind of work. And, and so now there's become a lack of availability. I've, I've showed you the boom. There's a lot of activity going on this. And so we're now being um, uh, versed with long queue times, somewhere between 18 to 24 months. And as this field is growing, the agency is running to keep up and still developing standards that we don't have yet. In small molecules, we may have an abundance of standards, practices, um, consensus programs that you can follow to support how you're making a product and where you can rely on established norms. In the biological space, a lot of facilities are doing this independently, and so you have a variety, a heterogeneous population of, I'm using the standard over here, facility over here is using something different, our products would not be comparable in that sense. And so there's a lot of challenges there. Okay. Um, again, just kind of highlighting these challenges. Um, manufacturing, utilize, utilizing living cell cultures. There's difficulty to control in a biologic space of your, your starting material to your final product. Um, stability. I mean, even stability of biologics is, is a big concern because um, you're, you can't keep these materials at room temperature. You have a lot of small molecules and other products may be able to maintain that, but the stability is important. You have to be uh, maintaining these in certain frozen environments and, 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 uh, or lyophilized. So, okay. Um, I'm now moving through this process. We're now hitting into the initiation of clinical trials. So I'm going to talk about some of the challenges and just uh, trial initiation, and uh, we'll, we'll move through this pretty, brief, uh, pretty quickly. So just a brief discussion. So clinical challenges now in biology. So we, this is still a young field. We still don't know a lot about these biologic programs. There's still a lot to be known about delayed adverse effects. These are based on the, the trials we've done to date are single arm trials, maybe without a comparator or a small number of patients. We're working, you saw the slide, it's a lot of rare diseases. So when you're doing trials with rare diseases, you're doing with trials with very small number of patients. And so we don't even know a lot about durability. These are still, I mean, in our program, we only got children that have been dosed out five years. What is the long-term um, durability of some of these uh, treatments? Um, you now have a lot of patients that are now post-treatment on certain CAR-T and genetic therapies. What are the uh, appropriate uh, medical care uh, needed for these patients? You know, concomitant meds, how do those interact? Um, we have shedding concerns where patients have been dosed with viruses and they do shed virus after post-administration. What are the concerns in, in uh, safety uh, environments for that? Um, still being understood. Um, as well as um, understanding new protocols as they come out, now begin to consider the inclusion, exclusion criteria for patients that have been on post-treatment. We have already experienced that. We now are opening trials at children's for uh, relapse uh, um, or refractory diseases, and we're seeing patients coming in post-CAR T therapy. Well, how do you manage that? That's a big uh, challenge. So um, interesting um, areas where it's just still a growing field. And then you're getting into the commercial challenge. So we're getting big dollars being pumped into these companies and seeing these things, these, these programs with such success coming out in the market. So Gensma, when it got approved, came with a big sting with a price tag at $2.1 million. Now, that's a significant cost, but it, there is a, the argument that it's a perceived high cost based on the fact of the alternative therapy at this point, Speranza, which is a routinely administered drug product for these patients. The company did justify their price tag that if you were an SMA patient taking routine Speranza administrations over the span of 10 years, you would be paying upward of $4 million. That's a, that's a significant uh, comparison. Um, we, don't, we hope to see our patients uh, survive out to 10 years and that this is a fraction of that cost. But uh, again, this is not something at Children's Hospital or Ohio State set these costs. These are, these are all run by the companies that, that market them. You also see this in the CAR T cell space with Kim Raya at, at 0.5 million. Per, these are per administrations. Um, 
This has been argued that in, contra in contrast for the standard care bone marrow transplant, you're paying around three to 400,000, but with the um, conditions that there may be possible multiple administrations for certain patients. Ultimately, there's a lot going on in the market here, and we're just at the beginning. And to understand how this is going to affect our, our society, it's, I think it, um, there's responsibilities on payers as well as these companies to measure the cost for the healthcare intervention in comparison to the value it offers. And the value it offers of an outcome should be both on to, to the patient as well as society and healthcare systems. As right now, a high concern is that there's not enough money in the system to support these kinds of lines of therapy. With the amount of development that's coming up, we're going to break the system. So we'll see how this turns out. Um, there's been some real creativity on how to pay for these kinds of uh, ex highly expensive novel uh, therapies. Um, for instance, Kim Raya, um, and I keep using these terms, and I apologize if you're not familiar with Kim Raya. Kim Raya is a CAR T cell therapy uh, for uh, leukemia, and um, it, uh, it utilizes, they have implemented a pay for performance. So it's based on outcomes. If you're a patient, you're uh, prescribed Kim Raya. Um, if you don't show certain outcome measures out to a defined endpoint, that you do receive a price reduction, that you won't be paying the full amount. Um, some of these are still being developed. Um, Luxturna, Luxturna was a gene therapy that was approved back in, uh, I think, 2017, or 2018, I'm sorry, uh, for retinal diseases. They have opted in a discount opportunity where, again, if you don't see um, certain outcomes, then you get a voucher, or a rebate on your, your therapy, your price of the therapy you paid for. Um, up to like even, uh, you know, mortgaging, consumer mortgaging, you know, pulling out a loan to pay for your, um, your medical therapy. So it's pretty unique and um, fascinating to see how our economy and society are going to adapt to these. Um, I'm going to just kind of wrap up to, um, despite the negative news that came out when Zolgensma was approved, um, I want to really recognize that this was a transformative medicine. It really changed the outcomes of some patient lives. Um, and also just to take a perspective on the program, how it took, the, it, it still, despite having fast track and expedited, these, these are very uh, complicated processes and took some time. Um, we ran this initially all as an academic center and was only until the uh, IND was approved that we finally began to have partnerships with first the company Avexis, which was then later bought up by Novartis. And we fully transferred all of our responsibilities into this, doing this development program in late 2015. And since then have been just you know, cheerleaders on the sideline, as well as our clinic being actively participants in the trial of enrolling patients. But our regulatory responsibility was uh, what we gave up. And been just excited to see the, uh, the, the um, opportunity to be a part from the beginning, to see it grow to the uh, stage it is at for full market approval is unique and, and exciting. And I, I, uh, I, I applaud all those that participated. Um, finally, just um, there's a lot of resources out there for you, any of you who are getting in this space or don't know about it and want to learn more. Um, the FDA puts a lot of information on their website. There's an FDA learning portal for students and academia and industry. My team reviews this regularly. Um, we are engaged in investigator-initiated applications. We're doing a lot of this work independently without sponsorships yet. I think that's an important. I think that's something we found to be valuable, that we're willing to take the charge and lead on these programs and then find partnerships as we move down the path. That partnerships is also important because we're now identifying the ability to de-risk these technologies, finding successes and finding opportunities to like have those engaged with the FDA, generating meetings and getting alignment, now raising considerable value in these opportunities. So if you're embarking in this, there's a lot of information the FDA has on the, how to apply and pursue your investigator-initiated IND, but we're a resource to Ohio State as well as children, so I also really strongly encourage you to reach out, come talk to us. We'll be happy to support you through this process as we've done um, um, previously. Um, guidance documents are critical. If you're in this space, understanding what the FDA thinks. There's codes of federal reg regulations out there, but that's just a high level. To really understand what the FDA is thinking and, and what they are expecting from you is built in the guidance documents. So reading those and understanding them, our team does that on a routine basis. If you need some direction or support, we'll be happy to offer that. There's uh, our website. You can find us on childrens.org, DDD. Um, I also encourage you to look at the resources here at Ohio State are substantial in the oncology and 
hematology space and the Drug Development Institute supporting cancer therapies. Um, have a great resource and a great team. Um, you can also find our information under the CCTS website. We support um, IND and IED applications as well as guidance, uh, regulatory strategy. Um, I want to thank the team. Um, Sue Martin, our program coordinator, really uh, supports a variety of off-label repurposing emergency access requests. Kevin Bossi, uh, our operations manager, um, really it, it, uh, uh, curates the, and supports the cell therapy applications we do in conjunction with Ohio State. Um, Rachel Manthe Gross is our uh, regulatory specialist now maintaining the broad portfolio of uh, gene therapy. Uh, Christina Cromaldi is our administrative citizen. And we have an open position. We're hiring. So if you're interested, is this a space you're looking at, please come talk to me. We're, we're, we're looking for some talented people that want to explore regulatory science. Um, last, just, um, you know, again, the story of Azogism was, was, was a great story. And it was all based on the opportunities to help these patients. Um, and these are just some of the snapshots of those patients that were, um, got to participate in the trial. And Evelyn particularly was the middle one who's been broadly uh, shared in the, in the public space. And um, it's a tremendous disease, the ability for her to run, walk, dance um, for a patient that has SMA type 1. That's it. <laughs> Welcome to ha take any questions. Carson? So, Chris, um, well, first off, everyone, there was a wonderful article, I think it was in Sunday's dispatch, I don't mm -hmm. know if it was the front page or in a Life and Arts, or, but it had this story. The Zogen's my case? Yeah, very good quality life yeah. story of what this technology and your team and all those multidisciplinary collaboratives that put this together. Yeah. Um, in the development, when you had your pre, pre INT, yeah. The, the first one? Yeah, with the um, FDA. Solgensma or even Speranza. Was, was phase zero even an option of, as opposed to phase one that you initiated in? Or is phase zero more purely in the oncology space? Yeah, that's a, that's a highly oncology uh, term. Um, we really haven't engaged any any phase zero work at this point. Um, there's some considerations about, in, in our world, we look at these expanded access kind of programs. There is a lot of talk about some programs saying, hey, um, getting a first readout in patients that are willing to um, uh, stand up for an expanded access program. There's been some um, programs, in, as well as industry companies, that said, you know, first patients in may, may be expanded access and not under a standard clinical trial design. So um, those are just some of the experiences we've seen. Holding those meetings, yeah. definitely. Um, I, I, I yeah, I could I could spend a whole talk on just talking about how to prepare for those meetings as they are critical. Um, but um, you know what what the what the what that go how that how the cadence goes is you request a meeting, the FDA will grant it. You have to supply them a lot of information, and the only uh, way to get a benefit out of that meeting is to inform the agent. You got to tell them everything. Tell them all the work you've been doing as best as you can. Because if you want feedback from them, it must be the most informative. They have to be really informed. You have to give them a lot of details around your program, your process, what you're thinking, what you want to do. And they will then be able to really articulate their opinion and how this can best work. And so step one is to really get them an abundance of information and as best as you can in the time frame the meeting allows. They'll then di take about 30 days to digest it, and they'll, they will read it. The agency will read a lot of your materials. I don't know if they'll hit every page, but they will definitely come away with a strong, and, and they're very intelligent, and they're seeing uh, an amount of these applications across the board. So they're very well experienced, too, because they're seeing applications from all over the globe. Um, and so then you get to the day of the meeting, what either the night before, you actually usually will get um, a pre-meeting uh, comments. They'll send you already a drafted list of responses, multiple pages, addressing each one. Oh, I didn't say, you have to ask them questions when you give them um, 
the package, right? So you have a list of questions you want them to specifically address. You know, we've come up with sometimes six questions, sometimes we got 20, it depends on what you're, you're going for. They will provide written responses in, prior to the meeting, and the best opportunity to take advantage of those meetings is then to spend, I mean, we'll order a pizza and convene around a table for the night and really dig into what do they think about our questions, what are the real things we really need to drill on. Let's not waste, you only get 60 minutes, don't waste your time showing a slide presentation of all your work. They already read it. You're going to kill the meeting. The opportunity is to dig into their comments and generate further questions or understanding or I don't understand why they want this. Dig into that and design your meeting around that. It is your meeting as well. It, the agency will get on the phone and say, okay, we're on the phone. What do you want to do? What do you want to talk about? If you don't have a set agenda, if you don't have a clear plan of attack, you will waste the meeting and, and it's, it's, these are limited. You only get so much time, so definitely encourage to prep, plan, um, have a, a strategy to, to work with them. And they want to help, they want to contribute. They're, um, they are a great resource. We've gotten um, a great dialogue with our reviewers, um, a good rapport with them is important. Um, I think I see Rachel in the back. She's now on pretty much first name basis with a lot of our reviewers and, and understanding what they need, how we need to go about business and making sure we can have success is, is just the, um, a big, big aspect of it. Yeah. Any other questions? So what are the side effects for this therapy and how we manage them between the Yeah. Yeah. So I've been sharing this. Of course. Yeah, I mean that's that's obviously the biggest concern. Everyone's addressing of what's a safety parameter, right? Um, so in this case, in the Zolgensmus story, um, you know, the first lines of addressing safety was in our animal studies, and we did toxicology assessments to address what are those um, findings. We didn't see much. We didn't really, we really saw pretty good safety outcomes in the animal studies, and that was limited to mice, mostly, and some primates, but um, there was very little information. It wasn't until you, and we showed that information with the agency, and they found it acceptable, and that's how we got into the trial. Now, once the trial was started, you will find other findings, and, and because you're now exposing patients to maybe the, these doses and, and, and more critical evaluations are going on, and we saw one common effect, it's well published, is the uh, liver enzymes. We do, we are, in the Zolgensma story, we're pumping in extremely high titers of virus into the body, right? And so um, these patients' um, livers are being assaulted. There is an insult to them, and we see a spike in liver enzymes, uh, liver function uh, tests, and uh, we had to closely monitor to see is that generating a, a toxic event? And um, luckily, the patients did not dis display any clinical um, outcomes or, or, or clinical uh, uh, signs of you know, jaundice or any other liver conditions. And so we just closely monitored. We do batten that down now with steroid use. So there's, um, uh, on the label for Zolgensma, there is a, a uh, indication for concomitant steroid use and how to, how to alleviate those concerns. Um, but that's based on the work done. Um, but in any other application, the first point to address safety is through the, those studies. And so, you know, my team would be happy to sit down with any of you and say, okay, if you're doing some of these studies, here's some endpoints could we look at? Could we begin looking at blood? Could you take some tissues out and look at PATH? You know, it doesn't have to be robust and across the board, but let's start taking the peaks at this. And that'll help you inform as you go down the road about um, further studies we need to look at and eventually maybe design your study to hone in on these in the clinical setting. Does that help answer your question? Anything else? Thank you.